So I don't know it's good, good, good to know, I think good afternoon. <laughs> and uh, so welcome to our uh, Asian uh, Pacific Analysis PT seminar. Today we are very happy to have a, a very distinguished speaker, Professor Yuan Lu uh, from Ohio City University and the Shanghai Jiaotong University. Uh, then me, before the seminar, I have a few words on the speaker. Uh, Professor Yuan Lu is uh, one of the leading experts uh, in uh, reaction diffusion equations, uh, elliptic parabolic equations with particular interest in application to biology. And Professor Lu went to Beijing University, got his uh, uh, bachelor and uh, uh, MPhil both in Beijing University. In 1991, he went to Minnesota. He got his PhD in 1995. Then he went to MSRI as a first doctor. And then he also spent two years in the University of Chicago. And eventually he set, settled down in Ohio State University. Now he's a full professor in uh, Ohio State University. And uh, this year he's visiting Shanghai Jiaotong University. Uh, Professor Yuan has done uh, many, many interesting work. Uh, he's a very productive leader uh, in the area of uh, reaction diffusion equations. He has published more than 130 uh, very high quality papers. And uh, so today we are very happy and privileged to have him as a speaker. Uh, he will talk on principal eigenvalues for elliptic and parabolic operators. Yuan, please. Oh, thank you, Professor, for the uh, nice introduction. And also, uh, I would like to thank all the organizers uh, for uh, inviting me to uh, to speak. So, so today I'm going to talk about the uh, principal eigenvalues for uh, elliptic and parabolic operators. So I will give some instructions on the on the question, and also then I'm going to go to, 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 to the details. Talk about uh, large drift limits, small diffusion limits, and I will also talk about the connection between frequency and the eigen, uh, principal eigenvalues. Uh, so, so the question which uh, I'm going to uh, mostly focus on is this called the time periodic uh, parabolic linear operators. So, so for for parabolic for these time periodic operators, so, uh, so this uh, v is uh, say it's a smooth fact field C one, and the the potential function C is also continuous. And uh, all these functions or vector functions are time. That's if if they are time periodic. Then this operator has a principal eigenvalue, uh, what, uh, which it really means that uh, it's it is uh, has it's it's real. It's a self. It's a real, and all among all the eigenvalues, it has a smallest real part. Uh, furthermore, it can be categorized by minimax, but usually because the operator is not not self joined, so we don't have a variational characterization, which creates uh, some difficulties. So essentially, it's a nice non self joined operators. Uh, how can we Study it's the uh, spectral radius for these operators. So, so in biology, uh, is like uh, ecology and uh, infectious disease, uh, the following question uh, repeatedly uh, emerge. So, how does the principal eigenvalue depends on the parameters? So, for example, the capital D is a diffusion rate, and alpha we call the drift rate, and the tau we usually call the frequency the inverse of the time period, the period. Uh, this question uh, has a, actually goes back, has a quite long history uh, on this question. So for example, uh, Peter Hess has a very uh, classical paper in 1990 book, sorry, book, 1990, 30 years ago on, on this uh, uh, basic materials of the principal eigenvalue for the time periodic operators. The book is devoted to time periodic problems. But there's a special case for, uh, for these uh, uh, operators. The special case is the time in the independent case, because when the vector field only depends on X and also the potential function only depends on X, the problem is actually independent of time. So it's, it's, it's reduced to a principal eigenvalue problem for linear second order linear operators. So the, for the simplicity, I will just talk about Laplace. It can be extended to uh, say uh, divergence form. Okay. 
Now the boundary condition here, uh, our in this talk, our I'll mostly focus on the Norman case. So the, the parameter B, so when B is equal to zero, that will be the Norman boundary condition, Norman. When B is equal to one, that will be the Dirichlet. So I'll, I'll mostly focus on the Norman boundary condition, uh, but, but, the, but let me start with the Dirichlet boundary condition because the study of this problem or the Dirichlet boundary condition actually has a, it's earlier, it's, it has a, it's, uh, it's, so the question is the same. How does the uh, principal eigen, uh, eigen, eigen value, which we call lambda alpha, depends on the parameters, say alpha, O, O, D, okay? Uh, so let me go to a, a very early result of uh, Wenzel uh, in 1975. So he considered, for example, this, uh, Second order epic operator, just with a uh, uh, very simple looking uh, alpha v dot gradient phi and a delicate bound condition. Uh, of course, uh, uh, phi can be chosen positive uh, inside. So, once I proved uh, that uh, the Aiken function, the principal Aiken value, grows at the most like alpha squared. What he so so this is uh, not too difficult. This result, this this uh, part is not difficult. But uh, what uh, Wenzel did is more than this. He proved that uh, lambda alpha of alpha squared, the limit has a finite limit. So he give uh, this uh, characterization of the limit. Okay, and this x is like a curve. So if this domain, if this is my domain, this x can can viewed like a curve inside the omega. Okay, so uh, what about, uh, of course this limit could be, uh, could be zero. So can we say more about this uh, limit? Or can we say more about this uh, principle in eigenvalue? Because uh, if you just show lambda alpha over alpha square uh, is, uh, has a finite limit, the limit can be zero, right? So then about the same time, uh, there's a group of uh, uh, mathematicians in Northwestern, uh, probabilists, I believe, uh, the first two are probably probabilists. The third one is my current colleague, Alvin Friedman. So, so for example, they show it can grow like, uh, C, uh, like alpha square if the vector field satisfies prop conditions like this. And sometimes it's even better. Sometimes you can even write out on the limit precisely. For example, if the vector field is a, is a potential vector field, then lambda alpha of alpha square, uh, the limit is exactly given. Okay, it's a very uh, precise characterization. Uh, if we go further, if we go pick more examples, so for example, they prove if the vector field vanishes at some point, then it can grow at a most like alpha, okay? Actually, it's an interesting question. What happens if the vector field vanishes on a curve or even in a low dimensional manifold? But I think that's be difficult in general. Okay, what's the limit? Okay, and uh, even what? Even well, I wouldn't say even worse. Even uh, more broadly, uh, or, or that's another example shows that uh, the when alpha go to infinity, uh, the principal again when go to zero could it be like exponential decay. Okay, so, so this tells us that the, the asymptotic behavior of these principal eigen values on the parameters is, uh, seems to be a, a subtle question. Uh, all the details depends on the vector field, basically. I'll skip most of the literature, uh, but I'll just quickly go to a, a, in a more recent one, but already it's uh, 16 years ago, by Berstigi, Amel, and Nadarshvay. For example, they consider that it's a divergent free vector field. And then they prove that uh, the limit uh, can be characterized by this Lorray quotient. Uh, but what is interesting is the admissible set of the Lorray quotient, which is essentially called set of first integrals. This uh, I1 is the set of the first integral. 
Uh, the, the really means is that all those functions in H01, such that it's the it's uh, gradient is perpendicular to the vector field almost everywhere. Okay. Uh, they also prove the limit could be infinity. And they, they show the limit is infinity if and only if this set of first integral is empty. So it's, it's quite interesting is that the behavior of the eigenvalues is closely associated with this uh, set of the first set of first integrals, which is somewhat related to the streamlines, I think as well, okay? So, so, so this is a very brief introduction uh, on the, some early works on the uh, asymptotic behaviors of the principal eigenvalues on the, say, the drift rate, okay? But, I, but this is also tells about the, sometime, about the diffusion sometimes, okay? Now, what about the normal boundary condition case? One would think, well, it could be similar, right? Normal or directly, but it's actually, it has a subtle difference. The first difference is, so if, if we move the, to the normal boundary condition case, and the reason we consider the normal is because of the biological uh, motivations, okay? Uh, for, for normal boundary conditions, one can immediately prove by the compression principle, say, lambda alpha, this principal eigenvalue, is uniformly bounded below and above. So this is true for any alpha. It's uniformly bounded. So you already, so, but for delicate boundary condition, usually you can be unbounded, as I said earlier could go like alpha square. But for normal, the function is the, the principal eigenvalue is always bounded in this case. So it looks easier. But uh, if we ask uh, the, if we ask this question, what is the limit of alpha to the infinity of this principal eigenvalue? This question is not, as far as I know, it's not an answer for the general vector field, as far as I know. Uh, because of the uh, because the, the, the vector of these arbitrary, okay, it's too general. Okay, so uh, so I'm I'm going to share with you uh, two results. The first result is again the uh, the same paper by 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 Brastiki, Amel, and another in two thousand five. So they consider the divergence free case, and. Uh, this condition is a natural condition for the normal boundary condition. And they prove that uh, the limit, again, is characterized by the Lorry quotient, but it's always finite. Now, again, the interesting thing is the uh, admirable set, but this admirable set is H1. So the difference is, of course, is not H01. Okay, it's just H1. So that's because of normal boundary condition case. Otherwise, it's similar, okay? Uh, so this uh, result is nice, but it still doesn't tell us what's the limit really, because it's the right-hand side is still complicated. But uh, this is uh, one special case, which is interesting. The special case is that if this set I consists of, of constant functions only, then, the right hand side immediately tells you because the gradient the gradient vanishes. It immediately tells you the limit is the average of the function c. Okay, so that's the first case for the normal boundary condition. With the so the assumption is divergent is essential assumption is divergent free. For a general vector field, usually we so you we can always do a Hodge decomposition such that this is divergent free. Right, then free plus the boundary condition plus some potential function, right? If the Hodge decomposition, okay. So, so the result of Brustiki and uh, uh, his collaborator shows that it works if only contains the divergent free part, okay. What about the potential part? So, this was a uh, uh, so. So the, for the potential, if the, so if the vector field of V is just a potential function, say it's gradient M of X. Okay, what happens? Um, 
So this is done by uh, Xinfu Chen and myself in 2008. So this is what we proved. Suppose the function is C2 and all critical points of M are non-degenerate, then the limit can be given precisely as the minimal value of C of X on the set on a set of uh, the set A capital M is the local maximum of M. Uh, so let me sh show you a picture to show you what the, the what the really this uh, means. Okay. So, so in this example, uh, omega is just a unit interval, zero, one. Okay. And the function M has two, has, uh, sorry, has four local maximums. Attain four local maximums. So, so the set of local, so the location is given by zero, x1, x2, and one, okay? So that's why in this case, the limit of the principal game value is given by the value of the function C. C is a potential function on these four points, four locations, and then choose the smallest. So this is a limit of the principal Eigen value, but uh, what about the Eigen function, right? What about the Eigen function? How does that look like? So, so let's say if this is attained by X1, say at the location of X1, after proper normalization, what, the, what the, this result really means is in certain way is that it's a Dirac measure concentrated near X1. So, so this is my, my, uh, our Eigen function, okay? So biologically, we know this uh, actually before we prove the theory, okay? Because biologically for us is this uh, M, the function M of X, we call the resource function resource function. So the phi of X is like a population density. Population density. So what it really means is that the, the population try to move along the gradient of M. So in other words, if you think about this, uh, so, so I'm right now visiting China. So in China, uh, there's uh, four uh, huge um, major cities, uh, Beijing, Beijing, Sh uh, Peking, Shanghai, uh, Shenzhen, and uh, Guangzhou. These are four big cities. So, so sometimes I joke about it. I say, oh, these four points, are these four big cities. So there's a lot of resources like jobs there. And five of, of X are like the young people try to move to these four you know, big cities, try to concentrate there, okay. So, so this is like a, a, a really like a concentration uh, phenomenon. So this is why I say, it's really, a, it's a concentration of mass because like when alpha go to infinity, the principal again function concentrates at some location of the local maximum of the N, okay. Uh, it's, it's a bit interesting because uh, the biology can give us some intuitions about the mathematics here, actually. Okay, so I'll just cut short. Now, what about time periodic operator? One can ask the same question about time periodic operator. So this is the first derivative term. So, so here, uh, we don't know how to do one dimension. Uh, well, we don't know how to do high dimension, so we only know how to do one dimension. Okay. Uh, so in one dimension, the drift term is given by minus alpha partial m partial x phi partial phi partial x. And we can ask the same question: What's the limit of the principal eigenvalue as alpha go to infinity? And this phi is time periodic, so, okay. Uh, so one can imagine uh, this might be similar as uh, time when, when, when this, uh, when, when, uh, when M only depends on X and C only de depends on X. This case, we know the answer depends on the 
local maximum of m of m of x, right? For the uh, time interdependent case. So for the time PR case, one would imagine the answer is similar. So one should consider something called a spatial uh, critical points, which really means that say fix the time, the partial m partial x is equal to zero. So these are really not a points in certain way. So if we think about the space and time, uh, let's say it's unit period. So, so these uh, are not really points. These are really curves in space. So because this is really like periodic curves, right? Like curves uh, here. Uh, but if we, if we cut horizontally at each location, it's a local, it's a critical point in space. That's, uh, that's what it uh, really means, okay. So it turns out, uh, let me give some uh, example. So, so look at this example. Uh, this example uh, is that the, if we cut horizontally, the function, so this is x, this is x, this is the function m. So the increase, decrease, increase, right? Because, okay, so the derf is positive, negative, positive in, 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 in space. So what this means is that there's a local maximum curve here. This is a local maximum curve. Corresponds to the, uh, this, this uh, chi one of t. There's another local maximum curve is the x equals one corresponds to this location, right? So what will be the limit in this case? Uh, it's easy to guess the answer for this case is, um, the answer is this. The answer is nothing but the integral of the function C on these uh, two red curves. One of them is chi one of S, the other one is C one of S. So you integrate uh, the function c in this uh, in time. You can think as in, in the in the in the on these curves, and then take the smallest value. So this is exactly or very similar to the uh, elliptic case. What this really means is that say suppose it's attained here. So what this really means is that the so the eigen function at a proper normalization. It's very much like a Dirac measure, x minus chi one of t. So it's very much like a, there's a Dirac measure here in space. It's traveling on this curve, okay, in period and doing this time, time periodic way, okay. But uh, but uh, this is just intuition, okay. We we cannot be we we cannot fully prove this yet actually, okay. But uh, but uh, we but uh, okay. But so the theorem is following. So this is what we can prove. So we prove that uh, suppose all the spatial critical points of M are non-degenerate. Let chi i of t and t and i runs from one to n be the set of the points of local maximum of M. Then the limit of the this uh, again, Function, uh, this uh, principal game value is nothing but the integral of the function C on these curves and then take the minimum, okay? Uh, there's a, a special case which uh, very intuitively, uh, very clear. So I'll just show the special case. There's a special case. Uh, this was uh, done by uh, Rui Pen and uh, Xiao Chang Zhao in uh, 2015. So, so let's take this case, the partial M partial X just positive. So this means in this case, uh, this set is very simple. This set is just this curve, this, uh, this one, just one t, right? Just x is equal to one, okay? So that's why in this case, the limit is just the integrated the function c, uh, c of one s and ds, okay? So, uh, of course, it also works for the, uh, a monotone decrease in case, okay. So this is what we uh, recently done with uh, uh, Liu Xuan, uh, Pen Li, and uh, Mao Lin Zhou. Uh. 
Uh, let me uh, show you uh, some example, okay? Because for example is all, always better. <laughs> so, uh, so here's example. So, so the it's a very simple example. The function is just a, a function of b of t. B is periodic, and times x. Uh, so in this case, suppose the function b say changes sign at so this is t. So suppose changes uh, change of uh, sign at t equals half. Okay, so it's, it was negative and a positive. Okay, then the limit is equal to the function first of all integrate at x equals zero from zero to half. So first of all, it's, so, so the Dirac measure is here. Then integrate from one to half. So then the Dirac measure jumps to here. So in this case, if you think about the eigenfunctions, so the eigenfunctions behave like this. So phi of x t is equal to the Dirac measure, say x, uh, sorry. So maybe uh, uh, a one of t times the diagram actually is x minus zero plus a two of t times the Dirac measure x equals one. Okay. So so for some functions a one and a two. Okay. When so it it was first the Dirac measure is the left hand side and then later on the Dirac measure jumps to here. Okay. <laughs> Unfortunately, our previous theorem doesn't cover this, doesn't even cover this simple example. So it was a, a bit disappointing, okay, uh, yeah, for this. Um, our theorem covers for the case where B is big or equal to zero case, okay. So for B, is, when the, this example is B is greater or equal to zero. Uh, that's, uh, and only equal to at one point, that's okay, okay, cover this case. Ah, there are there are many examples, but uh, because of the uh, time limit, I'll maybe uh, just uh, mention something quickly. So, so previously we assume um, this uh, the the quick points are non degenerate. So what happens if it's a degenerate? So in this case, so this is my x, this is my m of x t. If I fix the time, so you can see there's a local mac. It's a, it's a local maximum, so this is flat. So which means the partial m partial x is identical zero in this uh, interval uh, called chi one of t and chi two of t, okay? So if you think about the right hand side, this is x, this is time. And if you cut like this, it's a uh, flat here, okay? So again, our theorem doesn't apply in this case, okay? And the result is different, okay? Here's the limit. The limit of this, uh, as alpha goes to infinity in this case, the limit is equal to some normal body condition. So it's given by psi t minus psi xx plus c of xt psi. And the, now the, what's interesting is this domain now is only between chi one of t and chi two of t. Now, what happens at the chi one of two, chi one of t and chi two of t is the normal boundary condition. Okay. So, so if you think about this case, it's local maximum. Then put put the normal boundary condition here, and put the normal boundary condition here. That will be the limit. Okay. So the limit is uh, given by this one. So you want me ask? What happens if the degenerate points is here? It's, the, it's a flat, this is a flat here. Uh, interestingly, one what happens in this case, interestingly, one should put the Dirichlet boundary condition here, put the Dirichlet boundary condition here, that's the limit. So, so in this case, if it's a, it's a, lo, if it's a local, mini, local minimal, it's a flat, then it's given by uh, same, this is the same problem, but it's given by the Dirichlet bound conditions here. Okay. Uh, of course, when chi one and chi two 
if these two curves are very, very close, this again very big, is very big. So sometimes this term may disappear because it's too big. That's why sometimes you only see these two terms, okay? So, so I hope to convince you, maybe we're not convinced, I hope to at least convey that uh, the, uh, it uh, seems to be a subtle question to ask the asymptote, asymptote behaviors of principal eigenvalues for large Egypt, okay? Uh, for the, okay. But there's another case which I'll just uh, jump, okay? Jump over. So, so that's my uh, second part. I, I try to tell you, uh, try to uh, show you uh, some, some uh, results. What is the limit when the drift rate go to infinity? And uh, at least you see it's somehow connected with the uh, spatial critical points. The concentration of the principal eigenfunction near, happens near the uh, spatial critical points, especially those local maximums. Uh, another question is, what is about smooth diffusion? Uh, smooth diffusion, diffusion is, uh, turns out, is more difficult. Um, it's, it's, a, it's more uh, uh, complicated than the larger drift for, for, yeah, for, for, for some reasons, okay? Maybe some probabilistic can shoot. Can, I think they have some okay, good explanations for smooth diffusion and large drift. Uh, but uh, let me uh, talk about, uh, start with a very, very simple case. Say so this is a case without drift. So minus d plus phi plus c of x phi is equal to lambda d phi with the normal boundary condition. And easy to show as d go to zero, this here, this lambda d is principal eigenvalue. And it's also, also the smallest eigenvalue because in this case, all the eigenvalues are real. So one can talk about smallest, okay? And it's given by the minimal value of C. So this is uh, well known, okay? What is less uh, known is about so-called elliptic systems, okay? Uh, Norman Dancer uh, is uh, uh, one of our uh, pioneers in uh, these uh, elliptic equations, uh, semi-linear equations, uh, Norman Dancer. Uh, he considered this uh, case uh, in 2009. And later on, my collaborator, uh, Adrian Lan, and I uh, generalized uh, Norm's uh, result. This is the time, time independent. What about time periodic case? Uh, uh, I'll just mention a very recent work for uh, in 2020. They are already able to generalize uh, the Norman Dancer results and our uh, results to the time period case, okay. So this is without drift. What about the with drift? What about we add the drift, okay? So it turns out we don't know much, okay. Uh, actually, uh, as I only know how do I know how to do the uh, potential field case. Uh, I don't know uh, because Professor Xin is here. As far as I know, if uh, if the if this vector field is arbitrary or even it's diversion free, uh, I don't think I uh, I see the result as d equal to zero. What's the limit? Even for divergent free case uh, with uh, normal, I could be wrong, but uh, maybe we, Professor Singh can tell me. Uh, the, the, so even for the divergent free vector field with C of X, um, I don't think we know the answer for the, for the moment, okay? But for the potential case, if the vector field of V is potential, then we have some uh, results and the, the one of the results is again with uh, Xin Fu Chen in Pittsburgh. Uh, so the result says the following. So suppose it's a, uh, the gradient of M doesn't vanish on the boundary and all critical points of M are done degenerate. Then the limit of D of the principal eigenvalue lambda D as D equal to zero is given by the smallest value of C of X plus 
is a little bit complicated thing. So what is this function chi of x? This function chi of x are the eigenvalues of the Hessian of the function m. So this is the derivative is a Hessian. So, so again, so you can see this, this extra term, this is a new, this, or this is new for diffuse for, for small d. Because for larger, for larger direction, this term doesn't appear. But for this small diffusion, this uh, is more complicated. Furthermore, this set is also more complicated. For large drift, this set is just local maximum of m. But for small diffusion, the set sigma one, these are all critical points, right? These are just all interior critical points of m, interior critical points. Now, what happens uh, uh, for sigma two? Sigma two are essentially the local maximum in the vertical, you know, in the uh, normal direction and uh, critical points in the tangential direction. But anyway, it's more complicated uh, than the larger uh, diffusion. We, we still don't quite know the reason actually. Uh, uh, these terms just come out from our computations. So the, this, uh, this complicated term just comes out and the sets just com comes out from computation. Biologically, actually we don't have a good explanation why these two sets are all both involved. So that's a, a, a result. <clears throat> I'll just mention uh, what happens to the Dedekri boundary condition in this case. Uh, for Dedekri boundary condition, uh, this is done recently by Pan, uh, Zhang and Zhou in uh, 2019. The assumption is exact same as our normal boundary condition case. Now, if there's no integral critical points, the limit could be infinity. So it's already different. Uh, this is actually related with the uh, previous result with uh, Wenzel, right? And it's also related with the uh, works by uh, Friedman, which I mentioned early in 1970s, actually, it's already related. So the main contribution is the second part. So suppose there's an uh, interior critical points of M, then they prove this is the same as the normal boundary condition. Interesting. What's difference is that they only have the set sigma one. Of course, because the sigma two is, the local maximum of the boundary. So that doesn't appear, okay? Now, what about the, so why there's a difference uh, between the delicate boundary condition and the normal boundary condition? And the reason is because so one can, they also consider the lobbying boundary condition. So this is partial phi partial n plus uh, beta times phi equals zero. So for the lobbying boundary condition, they compute it. So sigma one appears here, sigma two appears here. Now they will have one extra term here. Okay. Now if this if this beta, so for example, is with, if the beta is equal to zero, this term disappear, right? This term disappear. When beta is equal to zero, this disappear, right? So this is exactly the our result with sinful chain. Now, what about beta equals one? When beta is, uh, sorry, well, what, what happens when beta is infinity? When beta is infinity, when beta is infinity, it's, ve it's very much like Dedekri boundary condition, right? And when beta is equal to fin infinity, this term becomes very big. So, so the, but this is taken as the minimum. So that's why this term doesn't appear in the Dedekri boundary condition case. So this is the Dedekri case. So the result of uh, uh, Pan and his calibrates uh, tells us clearly what's happening between Dedekri lob, uh, lobbying and Norman by uh, their calculation adding this uh, extra term here, okay? Now, what about time periodic? Because my memory, of my talk is about time periodic. So for the time periodic, again, we just can, right now can only do for one dimension. Uh, the reason is because I think it, uh, it's because our proof. So today I cannot go cover the proofs uh, because the construction uh, of the proofs uh, 
bit technical by the uh, constructing the super sub solutions of these uh, uh, these problems. Uh, so 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 the, again, the question is: uh, If we are d go to zero, what's the limit? We were st stuck by this for a while because the reason is that we think this set is always important. We think maybe the answer again depends on this set, right? The critical points of, uh, or, uh, or maybe the local maximums of this, or, or spatial local maximum of the M of XT. Okay. So actually we try to prove the solution phi behaves like Dirac measure concentrated on some say curve. And we try to say, oh, this curve chi uh, X. So we try to say the curve X equals chi of T is related with the local spatial local maximum of this because these are curves, right? We were not able to do it, okay. Um, later on, we found that uh, this is uh, false. This cannot be true, okay. So this is what we uh, found. So we found that the answer has to do with the ODE. So given by dp dt is equal to minus m of x p of t t. Here, the, because the function m is arbitrary. So of course this problem could potentially have uh, many, many time periodic solutions, right? So in some way, in some sense, if you think about this, this is very much like, uh, has something to do with uh, this, uh, I think has something to do with uh, this kind of operator. Uh, I don't know how to call this operator material to do derivative or something, okay. Uh, so, so this, uh, this periodic, so, so the periodic solutions to this kind of equation, maybe, I don't know how, maybe uh, it's related with the, not just with the spatial derivative, but somehow it's some, some certain critical points along uh, time and space directions, okay. So the result is the following. The result says that uh, let's assume the function m is non degenerate at the two ends of the interval. Uh, if the ODE has finite number of PR solutions given by P1 of t, P2 of t up to Pn of t, suppose there's a finite number. And suppose that all the second derivative of m doesn't vanish on these uh, curves. Uh, this condition holds uh, genetically because you can perturb, uh, as Professor Li Su Jie told me, you can always perturb M to make this happen, no problem. Okay. Then the answer is that as D go to zero, the limit is given by the, fun the integral of function on these curves plus the integral of the positive part of the second derivative of M on these curves. So this is, one can imagine in high dimension, this is like a Hessian of M, right? But we don't know how to do high dimension, okay? And then take the smallest value of, uh, of this, uh, uh, of this uh, finite uh, uh, choices, okay? So, so the main point is that, uh, so here's uh, what we guess. So we guess that the, now the function x of xt concentrates probably with maybe the, the answer is a proper normalization, maybe some pi of t, maybe concentrated near one of these periodic solutions. Maybe that's why it happened. And these periodic solutions doesn't have to be the local maximums of the n at all, okay? Or the critical points of n at all, okay? Uh, what happens if there's no periodic solutions? 
because this system, so for example, if partial M partial X is strictly positive, then this problem has no PRX solutions, okay? And then the answer is actually, is simpler. It's given by the smallest value at zero or the smallest value at, at as a small, the value of at zero or one, just take the minimum of those two values. So this is actually the, this is actually the easy case, okay? Uh, the proof uh, just involves uh, 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 constructions of uh, super sub solutions in this case. Okay. Uh, I think I probably running out of my time. Uh, okay, I, I think I'm running out of my time. I'm sorry. So I'll just give my example and quickly go to my last uh, case. Okay. So my last talk, uh, my last topic is the what happens. Uh, that depends on tau. How does that depend on tau? Uh, tau is like one over t is the time period. Uh, so we call it frequency. Frequency. Okay. So, and the question is, uh, and this question is actually uh, emerged from biology. So I'll just go to the uh, main result. So, just consider no drift case, okay? Consider no drift case. And uh, in 2001, uh, Hardison, Mishakov, and Peter Project, they proposed the following conjecture. Suppose that the, there's no drift. Then they say the lambda tau is monotone increasing in tau. Uh, they have some numerical simulation results. So you can see this is a JMB, it's a journal of mathematical biology. So the problem was completely biological, okay. Um, it was a very interesting question, uh, which uh, I wouldn't believe the answer is true because I, uh, I thought it, how can you know be so lucky that uh, the principle of eigenvalue is monotone in frequency or in the period, right? But there's some evidence. Uh, the evidence is that uh, proved by Hollison, Shin, and Vix. They show, so this result says lambda tau is less or equal to lambda infinity, really, what this means, okay? So again, of course, this, uh, this conjecture implies uh, this uh, result, right? It turns out this is true. So this is what recently we uh, proved. Again, with uh, these three young people, uh, Liu Xuan, Tan Rui and uh, Zhou Maolin. I'm thinking I, I'll finish, try to finish within two minutes. So this is our result. So suppose the, the gradient of M is equal to zero, then lambda tau is non-decreasing in tau for tau positive. Actually, there's a, a very precise characterization. Suppose the function, so let me write down the operator in it. So this operator is like this. Very simple operator. It's this operator. So suppose this function C can be written as a function of X plus a time period function, then lambda tau is in independent of tau. Others, otherwise, it's always strictly increasing. Okay. So, so that's uh, our uh, how but I don't have time to uh, to talk too much about the dependence on tau anymore. So I'll just uh, summarize. I also uh, skip the proof. <laughs> okay, sorry. Okay. So so if I summarize uh, uh, quickly using uh, using one minute of your time. So the what about the larger drift? I th we think the large drift in for the for the. Uh, in our case, we, so, so the, this is always, I'm always talking about the vector field is the potential case, potential of, of some function, some M, okay? okay. So then it's the concentration has something to do with the case concentration as a spatial local maximum. Now, what about the small diffusion case? This, it's, again, it's a concentration, but it's a concentration at the periodic solutions. Now, what about frequency? The frequency for us is like a drift in time, okay? It's a, like a drift rate in time. So the frequency 
is somewhat similar to the this kind of this shift in a certain way. Okay. So then I'll tell you what we really, really, what really want, what we want to do. Okay. What we really want to do is to figure out the topological and the geometrical structures of the level set of these principal eigenvalues with respect to the parameters. And the reason is because they have a very strong applications to evolution biology and the infectious disease. And uh, recently, uh, uh, Liu Xuan and I have a preprint on applications to infectious disease on this uh, something called uh, R0, a very common hot words, right? Recently, uh, because of the uh, pandemic, it's based called the basic reproduction number. Reproduction number. And to understand this basic reproduction number in infectious disease has a lot to do with the level set of the principal values with respect to parameters. And I, my time runs out, and I thank you. I will stop here. Okay, thank you very much for a very stimulating talk. And uh, we still maybe have time to entertain one or two questions or remarks from the audience. So any question, comments? So any question? Um, may I ask one question? Yeah, but, yeah. Um, there is a theorem which seems is somewhat related to what you presented here. It is much less precise and formulated in a different language. Perhaps you can comment about it. Constantine okay. some, some time ago proved a result about linear equation with the main part, which is a negative self-adjoint operator. And it has a perturbation, which is constant multiplied by a skew symmetric operator. So in, some, ah. so in a way, it is just uh, some cases that you discussed. And ah. it proved that when constants, the const, under some assumptions that there exists a sufficiently rough eigenfunctions, fun, eigenfunction of the skew symmetric operator that for, al, for the constant, your alpha say, tending to infinity, mm -hmm. you can get as big spectral gap as you want. Ah, okay, that's interesting. So I think uh, uh, this is actually something I'm also thinking. So I guess from my point of view is that uh, uh, the skew symmetrical part is kind of uh, has somewhat maybe similar to the uh, low, you know, uh, divergence free has some similarity, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so what that means is that maybe they are showing not just the first eigenvalue go to infinity, the other eigenvalues may also go to infinity, but the gap is also go to infinity. So, so that's what I would guess, but I have to see, I, I, I would like to see the reference to, to, to say more, maybe to see more precisely. But yeah, uh, I, it's- I a, can find it at some yeah. Sure, it's, that's interesting. But here I'm only talking about the first eigenvalue, but a very natural question is what about the other eigenvalues? What are the as, as the drift go to infinity? What happened? What's the uh, uh, growth rate of the other eigenvalues? So it's it's it's, it's related. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Ben. And uh, any other question comments? So you yeah, can I ask a question. You you just mentioned that that uh, uh, since the for the large, uh, for the small diffusion limits, you you can deal with the potential case. So if you have the divergence free vector field, right? Uh, yeah. Do, do you have uh, anything there? Um, we have some very very partial results. Um, um, so right here. Uh, Suppose the vector field is divergent free. Um, yeah. We for very very uh, uh, vector field like a very very special uh, shear flow, uh, shear flow. Yeah. We can we can we we can do it, but not we, we don't even know how to for general general shear flow. We don't even know how to do it. Uh, 
So, I, so maybe I'm missing some references, or I, I don't know because the so, even so, for some special. Mm. Uh, so, is that because uh, in that case the boundary layer will be stronger, or what? Uh, could it be? But the the. Uh, because it's clear there will be a boundary layer, right? Because the convection term, and mm. um, so if the structure with how how this match with the boundary condition in the in the mm. in the small diffusion limit, and mm. uh, so this, this definitely will 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 affect the uh, first arc function. It is yes yes yeah. yes. So you are right. So actually, we try to we, the cases we can do is to. Yeah. The case cases that we can do, I think we avoid those boundary layers. <laughs> with, the, with the boundary layers, I think we have to analyze the boundary layer quite well to see the damage. Right. I think that's a difficult. You are right. You absolutely. Right. I think you are right. Yeah. Yes. Because uh, when this turn vanishes, you have we have trouble. Yeah. With the match. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good, very good point. Thank. Thank. Yeah. Mm. And also, I uh, just one comments. It seems in the in a time periodic case. And mm. uh, it's, uh, the flow map seems very important, right? The essentially your your your, your particle path you define, which is the flow map, because if you think this uh, way is a vector field, right? So you yes. have the particle path of that. Uh, so then the the transport equation you are talking about is really a, a flow map. Yes. So and, yeah. Right. So your behavior of the it depends on the flow map has a periodic solution or not? Is that right? You mean for the for this case for the frequency dependence case? Or? No, no, no. Even for the previous one, for the previous one. For the previous one. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, you, then you define the right. That's right. Exactly. So yes, that's right. This all the is the flow map. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So so I I agree. So I we think. Uh, in high dimension, maybe still related with the uh, the flow yeah. map. Yeah, yeah. But uh, but we don't know how to do it yet. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But it's right. Like, it's already very interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Any other question comments? I think if not, people will probably ask you a question in a couple of hours. Okay. Yeah, well, I, I will you record. You have a very interesting talk. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, Thank yeah. you, Professor Xing. Thank you. Thank you to everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Take care. Thanks. Bye bye. Yeah. Okay. I'll join the coffee room. Hope to see you all in the coffee break. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank bye, you. bye bye. Everyone, bye -bye. Should, everyone should have received invitation to the coffee break with the link. So let's meet in a few minutes. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Okay. So yeah, I, I I have to skip the half hour because I sure, have to sure, at sure. Okay. Thank, okay, you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Yeah. Hope to we'll see you another case. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. So may I close the meeting now? Yeah.